Hi, um, this is Mitch Weisberg, and happy summer, everybody. Uh, we're, welcome to EdChat Interactive. Uh, it's uh, not quite four o'clock here on the East Coast, but I thought that rather than wait, make you wait, that uh, we we do a quick intro and then get Dave up here as fast as possible. And then what we have coming up here is Dave Nagel, who's been in education for 18 years, who has a uh, widely selling book out effective grading practices uh, for secondary teachers uh, who can also talk about effective grading and feedback practices for elementary school teachers too I'm, I'm sure and uh, and he's going to be talking to us a feedback that's meaningful and motivating and helpful to students so I'm going to stop my slides and let me bring Dave up on the stage Excellent. hey Dave how are you? So yeah, we're up. Good, good. So I just on a personal note, I think that you, you should tell everybody what you've been doing for these past three days. I was uh, coaching a basketball camp with my 11 year old and about 350 other kids who 12 of them were assigned to me. So I haven't coached in about 10 years, but stayed in the college dorm and ate dormitory food and scared 11 year olds to death, made sure they go to bed on time. Really Which is great. To once a year. computer by myself. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Uh, so I think what I'll do is I'm going to stop my broadcast and I'm going to bring up your first slide and you'll just tell me how to when to advance the slides. Super. Okay. You betcha. Thanks, Mitch. Well, I do appreciate everybody jumping on. It's summer, and when we did this first session back in May, I think it was around May 28th. That's that session is archived. We realized that, and how this is going to work is I'm going to speak for about eight to ten minutes, give or take. And then we're going to have a chance to get into small groups and have some discussion. It's one of the things I really like. Most of these webinars that we do, we get some good information, but we can't process it. So saying with that said, there's only about 16 to 18 minutes of my sharing any ideas. And we decided that we needed to kind of cut it in half. So the last one really focused um, on failure prevention. This one, I'm going to get into a little bit more of, of sort of standards-based type practices um, and some approaches and things I specifically shared with the book. But Mitch, if you could skip to the first slide. Um, for those of you that are on social networks and things, and, and you are into Twitter, we're going to leave this up for just a moment, but I've got my Twitter handle, uh, the book, and a lot of the work I do with grading goes through Corwin, the Corwin Press, certainly the EdChat one, and then the hashtag I've been using is grading for impact, and then I've also included my email, because as this goes forward, um, and you have an idea that you don't get a chance to share, or you or someone else watches the recording, you have an idea, a thought, or interested in any follow-up conversation, you could have that as well. So most of these Twitter handle and emails will be kind of at the bottom of every kind of slide handle. Uh, Mitch, if you jump to the, to the next slide, just kind of as a quick overview, and certainly I, I will tell you it's far from, far from Shakespeare, and those of you that have purchased it or given me feedback on it, I really appreciate it. But when I, when I got into actually putting this piece together as a former middle school and high school teacher, uh, grading has been the one area that I think we can – say it's probably gotten in the way of a lot of good feedback assessment and practices and it's different at the secondary and elementary level and occasionally high school teachers and middle school teachers think that they're a lot different and one thing's really geared towards them and rightfully so so really set it up like that and today we're going to focus specifically on part three but i am going to mention as i do every time that at the end of the day <coughs> excuse me practice trump's policy and core grading actions like collaborative scoring Providing students with what I call stipulated second chances. Um, mul multiple opportunities for proficiency can sometimes get misconstrued as redundant test taking. Uh, the penalty for not doing the work is doing the work, and there should be some consequence, so to speak, but that doesn't mean that the quality of the work is devalued because it's in late. And I think if that's a core grading action, every classroom teacher can adapt it to their needs and still be utilizing the same general practices. But today, for our time, we're going to get into that part three, and specifically what, more importantly, are probably standards referenced grading. Um, true standards-based means at the end of you know, the time of meeting all the standards, we're going to move on. So a high school junior that passes all of this U.S. History 1 standards, usually in November, doesn't move to History 2 unless the whole, whole class did. So really what we're looking at is how we make the grades a little bit more focused standard and how we use feedback to drive learning. So I'm going to have Mitch jump on to the next slide. And one of the things, and actually it was very appropriate this week as I was working with uh, 
the, the kids at this camp, and it was a shooting camp, and, and it's one of the top in the country, the Baumgartner shooting camp. And what they do is they, we really invest the time working the shooter from the bottom up, from the feet all the way up to the body, but it's the footwork that matters and getting them to do the same one, two step every time. And the idea, just like with math facts, that they, they do it so repetitively, it becomes second nature. It's that deliberate practice. And I got on my kids a lot about doing the drill half-hearted because it's a bad habit. We can take that same concept of deliberate practice, whether it's in science or history or writing an essay and realize that practice by in and of itself means we should be allowed to learn from our mistakes. And we want kids to be deliberate in terms of how they're practicing whatever skill it is. It's hard to do that and develop mastery if every time I make a mistake, we're ready for it. So Mitch, if you jump to the next slide, we don't have to abandon grading just because we want to focus on deliberate practice. There's actually some things we can do and still allow, to be honest with you, with some of the traditional grading actions that I think teachers are at least are still accustomed to and parents still want. I think there's a way to merge both. Now, obviously in an ideal situation, all we're focusing on is what happens at the end. And I think we can get there and not have to move mountains and have people do it overnight where sometimes they struggle with the how. So um, I'm gonna have Mitch jump to the next slide. So in, in, the, in the book, I talk about five strategies that will build towards standards-based assessment, feedback, and eventually grading. The first one, which I didn't highlight in yellow for a reason, is a blinding flash to the obvious, that what I score, what I assess, is actually focused on academic standards. And there's not a standard that I've ever seen written that says you will complete your essay with a friendly edition, or you'll do so within my two-week grading period. So time has to be separate. The ones we're going to talk about are mastery grading, minimizing how much teachers actually grade, accurate weighting, and then something that I think is critical. And this is where I don't jump into the debate or argument about the zero, because it's really not about the zero. It's about eradicating the average, because it doesn't tell us where any learner is today. It tells us the number of attempts it took. And it might take Mitch 50, it might take me five, but if we end up at the same place, we can both perform that skill today. That's really what matters. So we'll walk through two practices here before we take our, our first break. And so this session will just a little bit longer, but I want to give us a couple of concrete examples, um, kind of applying with that, those first two about mastery grading and minimizing what we grade by grading later in the learning process. So Mitch, if you would jump to the next slide. I'm going to talk through this one and then give us kind of a moment to, to digest it. The idea of mastery grading and Tom Gusky's work is a lot of places where I've cited and, and actually utilized some of Tom's work and certainly give him um, the credit that he's due for his years and wealth of research in this area. But so far too often, I did so as a teacher, student who I like or didn't like, but let's assume I really like this kiddo and they turn and just absolutely really well. Problem is, is what I might do or teachers might do is give them 17 points or 15 points or some arbitrary number that we throw into the pot and we hope later that it adds up to something. Well, the problem with that is, is we're kind of perpetuating bad behavior. We're having students think that you can continue to get by with not being at a proficient level. And now as a teacher, I'm not able to provide the kind of instructional feedback. So the first thing we want to do is determine what is significant progress? What would be a level of mastery that would show indication towards the next level of learning? And let's say for our purposes now, we're going to call that 35 points on a 50 point assignment. Anything less than that, and it's important that this is not seven problems or eight problems. This is a student can write an essay with three citations and the persuasion aligns with the text. There's, there's some measure so that way what we've described as clear success criteria, but whatever they turn in that is below that, we don't give them points, we give them feedback. And I know sometimes, and this has actually come up a lot, in my conversations with teachers in the last probably six to nine months, the electronic gradebook won't let us do that. We gave grades before we had electronic gradebooks, and, and let's not let something that is supposed to empower us and bring parents into the, into the discussion inhibit us from doing what's what's effective for students. The more we have parents checking on those grade sheets, that's phenomenal, but that can't prohibit us from doing what we know is right in the first place. And as a parent, if I look at my son's in a grade sheet and I see an assignment that is in progress, which tells me he tried it and just didn't get it, as opposed to one that there's a blank or even a zero, I have a different strategy for that. So I think this is an easy sell for parents and I have yet to meet whether it's um, mastery manager, they come to me in a second, there's one called A+, there's one called PowerSchool, there's a few others. 
that we're not able to manipulate the system to have some type of reporting like that, where it doesn't get calculated into the grade, but it tells the parents and the student, hey, their work is. The next point about this is if we want students to use our feedback, respect it, I'm sorry, if we want our students to respect our feedback, we have to allow them to use it. So let's say a student hands in that work and they get to that 35 and we provide some feedback. They turn it in and do exactly what we've asked them to do. They, they've taken our teaching and applied it. We can't penalize them because they didn't do it on the first run. The other thing is what we can't do, and this has come up before where a teacher has said, you know, the student got to the 35 or whatever number it was, and I gave him the feedback, but you know, he he didn't move on. He just he he stopped at 35. He, he didn't move on to the next level. Okay, we got to get over ourselves. That student also has other classes. But if that significant progress is strong enough that they're working down the road towards where we want them to be, well, then that's fine. Because what they didn't do is get to a level that was so below proficiency and think they were on track and then got a certain amount of points that they threw in the pot. And eventually there's some higher level determination of mastery. Um, yeah, so, so really the question is we're going to get away from in training aside the, this little reflection question that was going to get us to another point, but I felt like there was a lot. One more, there we go. So just thinking about mastery grading, you know, determining those specific thresholds for degrees of mastery. And then if we're using points or marks or if we're using something like that, um, making sure the students reach those levels, providing feedback, but also the opportunity to move on. But anything below a certain threshold, what we're not going to do is put things in the grade book that we're going to average or calculate later. So a general topic, um, just point one, we'll, you do, we'll do point two here in just a moment. And uh, let me take you down off the screen. We'll get into some small group discussions for about eight minutes. Hey, Dave. Hey, so several So were you, you able to... Um, go ahead. I was going to say, ahead, were you sorry. able to join some of the conversations? I was, um, and I was able to join um, Luis, who's from Spain, so that's pretty humbling that we've got somebody way across the pond that wanted to join in. Um, and then I talked with Greg and Julia for just a moment, but a couple folks sent a, sent a message, and I wanted to, I think this is probably a clarifying point. Most often, and, and at least with rare exception, and it's kind of a standing comment I've made, but if you ask a high school, middle school kid, but let's say high school especially, and they come home with a C, and their parents say, why did you get a C? What do most kids say? I don't know. Uh, the teacher doesn't like me. They might say that, but a lot of them say they don't know. The thing is that they're not lying. So the idea is that whatever points are get, so 15 points means I could cite three references. 30 points means I've cited all four and I've got a proper conclusion and summary. The idea is that if we're going to continue to use points or marks, or even if we're going to use 4321, because I think there's a misnomer that we'll just lose 90, 80, 70, 60 to 4321. The problem there is we are going to the default three or we still have students who are really doing four work in your class, but I gave it a two or vice versa. So the idea is that that, that predetermined, and the other point was, and that's why I'm gonna pull Julie up here in a minute, because you, you mentioned, and I know actually the students at their school, you could have multiple levels. It's one of the, the things about sort of a Nintendo or PlayStation effect. Kids will keep playing if they see themselves getting to the next level. So it could be 20, 30, 40, whatever that is, but each level is not just quantitative. They didn't just do more. And so then that way we've got the ability to provide not critical feedback, but effective feedback. And Hattie talks about task or process feedback. Task at a very emergent level, process where there's some level of proficiency. So again, I think this can be adapted, but the idea is once students hit a certain level, that's what equates to a point. And that's in a predetermined skill demonstration, not if I'm right to cross my fingers, throw it in the pot, and hope when we hit equals, it comes out positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And did, did you want to bring somebody up? Well, if we could pull Julie up real quick. I would just love to hear her talk. I, I pulled Greg up, but he would talk the whole time, so we only have a half hour left. Um, Hi, Julia. Oh, wow, it's actually working. Hi, Julia. Hi, how are you? <laughs> um, I was just talking to Greg <laughs> about our, um, our population we work with um, an alternate program through our high school so we've been um, at the bridge sorry we've been kind of 
working more towards credit retrieval and having the students kind of progress through and earn their credits through kind of make sure what they do know and just getting through it. Um, so it's a lot, it's based more on progress monitoring and what I was saying to Greg was that one of the teachers that I work with, we um, work through, what is it, Play-Doh? So it's a lot of progress monitoring through the interactive online classrooms and a balance of notes and physical presence in the classroom. So it's feedback definitely works a lot better with them because we can start and say, oh, well, I see that you're getting to to what the point that we want you to be to at. Sorry. Um, but it definitely, it definitely helps a lot when we give them that feedback and they say, oh, okay, so I see that we're getting it and we're not going to discount everything that you have done, but we're trying to make you get to a certain certain level. And again, being familiar, I am being familiar with when I say your students, I say your students, the students put into the bridge. Put the bridge. I don't think I have a student on the other students. But this predetermined criteria for points is understood up front. And that's the thing to remember about, you know, when, when Hattie talks about feedback, it's really going to lose a lot of its value unless there's success criteria. So that significant progress level, the students understand that. And that's a piece so that way when we are telling them why they haven't gotten to this point or whatever those quote unquote points are it's because they would know well i haven't gotten eight out of ten right or i haven't been able to you know demonstrate with proficiency how to you know calculate the titration on a beaker or whatever that is then more often than not we have fewer of those issues and they're not looking at it as critical they're actually looking at it as helpful because we're helping them get there i think the other point is is we're letting them know that, that 50 can be gotten by every student as long as they want to put in the time because if we give them the feedback and they do it especially if they've you know met the first deadline there's no reason to cut them off um, but also that significant progress has a level of value that lets us know hey they're 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 getting it we're not just giving them or inflating their grades and i gotta say this is probably a place where it's going to minimize grade inflation more than it's going to have anything to do with minimizing the deflation because it's not going to allow students who are not proficient to just walk out without a certain level of skill and get a passing or a high grade. Mitch, I'm thinking we could move on. Um, the next point of what we might do then is um, go through the next two points and then just kind of adjust the discussion. We kind of go back to those five points that we started off with, the idea of minimizing grading. And actually, I'm going to have you go to the, the next slide. Um, so I'm going to hit kind of minimizing grading and then the point about the accurate weighting. Um, this is one of those other kind of blinding flashes of the obvious. When, when I dug into to John Hattie's feedback study, um, which is his meta-analysis, there's countless studies around feedback and one of them was, was Kluger and, and several others. And when we're learning something new, we shouldn't be graded. I don't care if that's how to, you know, in a fence or how to figure out my, my classroom practices or whatever it is, there should be the ability for me to not feel like I'm getting evaluated immediately. And we grade students early in the learning process. We're really grading them on what they brought to the table before we got them. What will happen is, is one of two things. Either they will stop where they're at and say that's good enough, and they will not want to not be as smart or as bright. And whether that's in basketball or whether that's in math, when they get the first few right and they get the high grade, well, then there's a struggle for them to continue on because they don't want to, they want to avoid that. Or they get dinged for not having prerequisite knowledge and then they shy away from the learning altogether. So as you mentioned earlier, I talked about the need for deliberate practice. So if we could quickly skip to the next slide. I won't stay on this one too long. Um, there's a reason why they call it training camp. Whether you're in the military, whether you're on the soon to be Super Bowl champion Indianapolis Colts, because that's where I live. The point is, is, no matter how many mistakes they make there, it's about practice, practice, practice. But there's a point where if you're not good enough, you don't make the team, you get cut. So let's talk about how we could look at training tasks in a classroom setting. So if we go on to the next slide, I'm going to speak to this one, which is um, got a biology background, but I think we could, could change it to whatever our content was. Biology, for example, and I know Greg, who's on, on the call, is a former biology teacher, Take a unit on genetics. What is critical early in that unit is not the students knowing a lot of vocabulary. What is critical is they understand math probability. 
they know how to multiply fractions. Well, it might take one student 10 times, it might take another student three times. The point is, is that's a skill they have to acquire. So we can have what are called training tasks that don't count for points, but students must receive certain mastery. So everything towards on the left-hand side of the blue line, that's because that skill is so critical for the rest of the unit. Let's say for an English class, it's, it's writing a solid essay, um, a solid argumentative essay. Well, one of the things you gotta be able to do is be able to defend an argument. If you can't defend an argument, it doesn't matter how strong your transitions are, your conclusion or anything else. The point is, is those first two tasks, students have to get to a certain level of mastery before they can move on. We're not gonna give them any points. We're not gonna count their mistakes against them. Now, what happens when I share this example is people will say kids are motivated by points. I agree. But you know what motivates most kids more than points is less work. So once the students are proficient, especially on those first two tasks, they get to skip the next one and get a buy. And that not only is a strong motivator, it allows me to know when the students are moving on to the next task on heredity or genetic disease or whatever that is, they might have a better chance to be successful throughout the rest of the unit. So, and again, this isn't applicable for every unit at the same degree, but I want us to think about whenever we're teaching a content or skill throughout a unit that we know is so foundational, what, is the, what, are, what are the chances to make sure early on we cultivate the deliberate practice by making sure the students don't feel your mistakes are crushing you, but you got to get to a certain level. You got to get, you got to show me that you know enough of it. And when this happens, more often than not, what teachers are saying, they are grading less because they're doing it more often than not in the classroom. Because those first three, those are things we're going to do together in the classroom. And again, there's a lot more detail to this example with a couple others in the book in chapter seven, but I think this one kind of captures uh, a lot of the essence of what we're talking about. And then we move on to the next task. I was kind of intentional to see, you know, sometimes it's 35 or 50. Other times, maybe it's 70, 80, 90, or 80, 100, or 120. You know, there might be multiple degrees. We have students reach a certain ladder. Um, and that all depends on what the task you're doing. And as a final point before we're gonna move on to one other example and then have our, our last discussion, the evidence that students are showing me Actually, Mitch, if you could go back just to the previous slide. Evidence the students are showing me in the heredity task is not of the same value based on what this teacher put together as that summative performance assessment. And so accurately weighting anything we do is critical. So Mitch, I'm gonna have you skip one slide and go to the one after the next on accurate weighting. This is, uh, I was working with a, a group in Nevada who I've been with uh, a lot and they, one thing about, practices is there's not this mathematical formula that I'm asking anybody to calculate. Um, and so it's it's a little bit messy because we're talking about learning and we're talking really about pushing the grade away as far as we can. Well, people got a little frustrated and they, they want to know exactly what to do. And one of the teachers asked, they said, Dave, what's the recommended default? I go, okay, that's a pretty good one, the recommended default. And it's accurate weighting. At the end of the day, if we're weighting the evidence with accuracy, we have a chance. Sometimes what students show us here is really only this much compared to something else. So that almost takes the zero discussion out of it. Because if a student does a very phenomenal job on an assignment later in the unit that's really putting a lot of things together, and I weight that at 80, and then down here, I've only weighed some of the earlier things at 10, and then it's not as important. Now, at the end of the day, if he shows me what he knows, we shouldn't average it. But this is also a way I think that gets us much more to a place that if a student receives an A or a B, that tells us what they know and can be able to do. If they don't, aren't able to show me at a certain level, then it's going to be almost impossible for them to receive any level of high grade. And we can also look at how we do this within one task. So, uh, Mitch, if you go to the, the next slide, I'll get through these, these last two. Most schools, not all, weight their AP courses. They weight their AP Honors and AP Chemistry and things like that, or AP Chemistry, AP English. And Cogner and, and David Lang from the University of Sacramento are kind of the leading researchers on weighted grades, David Lang especially. One of the things that he found was that when students take an AP course, for the most part, obviously we've got some extremes. Students who get a B, for example, in AP Chemistry, AP Science, it's usually worth about a year's worth of growth in college, and that student who would have gotten a B, it's equivalent of at least an A in a regular class. So schools want to define excellence, but they also want to provide an extrinsic incentive. So 
take the relatively easy course or the, the standard course for 1.0 or take the very difficult course for 1.0. We know what happens. So a lot of schools create that extrinsic incentive for students to be challenged with the AP course. My question is, why do we have to wait for an AP course for that to happen? We have students that either can't take an AP course because of their schedule or they have passion within a certain topic, within a unit of study, within a course, and they will go above and beyond. Why can't they earn additional points for more rigor in some areas, which makes up for their defaults in other places? I make a lot of mistakes in my marriage. I'm gone a lot. I'm not around the kids. When I'm around, I'm not as active as I need to be. Especially I buy my flowers. That doesn't make up for it, but it at least gets me off the hook. There are certain things I can't get away with where flowers would make up for it. There are certain things that you have to be able to know to be able to pass. But why couldn't we, Mitch, if we go on to this, these last two slides, and I'll just kind of speak to this example, and I, I cite it in detail in the book from a, a teacher I was working with, that in their English course, it was 11th grade class, and they were focusing on the standard, determine, understand, and anal analyze complexities of a text and determine where the author leaves matters uncertain. One of the things that the teacher did is they were reading um, Keats' poem, Ode to Aggression Earn. They had to determine with the poem where Keats left matters uncertain. Some of the kids were actually really getting into Keats' work, and they said, well, what if we took five of his poems and identified the theme of uncertainty across five poems? So when she said, that's actually a pretty good idea, and the kids said, well, what do I get for it? I mean, all things considered, that's at a higher level of rigor. So she designed this very general rubric. There's more detail that I, I, I used from her in the book. Technically, it was an AP assignment. And so on an AP assignment, just like in an AP course, you could actually get 40 for 30, or you could get additional weight, not something that's disproportionate. If you get the two on the challenge task, wouldn't that be the equivalent maybe of a B on a regular task? There is a point where if a student attempts the challenge task and they can't get enough proficiency, they gotta go back and do the first one. What this gives us are two things. This is truly standards-based extra credit. Also, let's say a student misses an assignment three months ago. We don't want him or her to make up that assignment today. By doing that, we do two things. We're taking their mind off the learning that we're doing today. More often than not, we're perpetuating the bad behavior. We need them just to complete an assignment from before, just to get it done, just to get some points, and then wonder why we can't get them to put forth so Greg misses an assignment in February, and it's the middle of May. I'm not going to let you make that assignment up, but I will give you a chance on a more rigorous assignment to earn, quote unquote, those points back. But also, if a kid is very passionate about one of your topics, why couldn't he or she go deeper in one and not have to be a jack of all trades within each and every unit? Certainly, there's a level that they have to show us within every unit, so to speak. But here is a chance, and it's far from perfect. But I've heard teachers say this example has created more opportunities for kids to get the same quantity and quality of standards assessed, giving them more ownership. And they have found kids that have had one or two units that have gotten so engaged because they realized they could go deep here and maybe let a few other things go. And to be honest, guys, I think we all know this is the real world. And every one of our jobs, we're really good at something, we struggle at something else, but maybe we have a peer that's opposite of us. So. Mitch, the, the last slide, or the next one, um, again, this is you know, how it could look in, in, in a great book. So we have Kristen or Brittany or Mark or what tasks they attempted. And again, there was a level on challenge that they had to get to, which was a two, or you kind of had to start again. Maybe on the general one, it was at least two or one, or you had to start again. So again, it's not about the, the marks averaging them, but it's adding that additional weight for more rigor. So, Mitch, my, my question, reflection question tasks are, are not going to be lined up yet. Um, so really, it's, it's the two questions, and they're just on different slides. You're not going to be able to change them up. It's kind of the training task conversation that I wanted to ask people around, or the idea of weighting certain tasks with more rigor, because I'm going to go ahead and skip that last part, because I, I want us to have a 10-minute discussion and wrap up right on time. So we'll kind of leave it up to you to kind of maybe flash those two reflection question slides. They're just not... They're not together like I thought we would have had. Just because. So I'll just speak to this one, next one, and then we'll just have our discussion. So we really kind of covered two points, and so I'll just let the group kind of decide who the person they want to talk to. First one was the training assignment. You know, the idea of promoting deliberate practice, focusing on mastery, and not really grading their mistakes, but they got to get to a certain level of proficiency. And the next one was 
that reflection question number two, which kind of addresses the last point that we talked about, which was accurately weighting more challenging and rigorous assignments, which allows us to sort of eradicate at some point in time the average. So, Mitch, I think if you leave the next final before the, the slide up, this will be a good one just to leave up while we have our, our small group discussion for about eight minutes. No, I'm sorry, one more, the, the reflection question two. There we go. Okay, so this is, again, a time for you all to get into small groups. You can click on Dave or you can click on each other. And I think that we're, we're talking about two different areas. One is the is the idea of deliberate practice and to provide activities for students early on in the learning progress in learning, early on in the learning process where you're not grading and so that students can take risks and and concentrate on learning and then uh, two is the idea of challenge of challenge tasks and eradicating the average Okay, so let me bring Dave back up for a minute. <clears throat> when you were talking before, I really like the idea of um, <clears throat> of you know, kids. Yes, they're motivated by grades, but they're even more motivated by doing less work, and that could be a, a strong motivation factor, especially early in the class when you're really encouraging them to master things rather than giving them grades. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I thought that was a really yeah, interesting and, point. How did your conversations go during the break? Um, there wasn't a lot, to be honest. I, I think folks are, it is a little bit a lot to digest. I, I, Lewis and I couldn't mm -hmm. connect with each other as well over the audio. But a couple of IMs, and I think it's the, these are a little bit deeper thoughts because, again, when we've looked at grading before, I think it's been how we, populated and how we report it out. This is really mm -hmm. making me as a teacher step back and think about what am I supposed to be assessing the students on and then does my current assessment tool, my worksheet, my task, does it really show that and then how much different rigor level is it from here? And, you know, I mean, let's face it, if, I don't know, Butler beats Duke, that's a little bit different than if they beat small school from Western Ohio that's private with, you know, 250 kids it's a little bit different weight in the point standing so i think that's an area where if we if we only focus on the grading scale we only focus on the reporting we talk just about the zero we're not really moving the needle because at the end of the day it's supposed to be about learning um but as i mentioned Mitch, the, those last couple of slides that we kind of didn't get okay to so I'll, like I'll, I'll bring the slides up perfect thanks so much so the one kind of maybe final point, and I don't think it's it's as much of a one to discuss, but at the end of the day, just like smallpox did for world health, we eradicated it. If there's one thing we can do in this whole idea of grading, assessing, is to just simply stop averaging and to pretend that the, the level of mistakes or the level of tries comes in together. And I understand it because let's face it, how we grade a lot of times, how we do school, it's just what was done to us, but there's a lot of things we don't do that we used to because we know that they're just not the right thing for kids um and occasionally what will happen is, is we get that that idea of fairness well you know it's it's not fair it takes greg five times to do it and it takes me 10 then we get the same grade uh, it's also not fair when greg and i walk into a classroom if he is well fed and his parents are supporting him and they're checking his homework and he had really really good teachers the year before and my parents aren't involved because maybe they're trying to make a living and I've changed schools three times and I'm not as well fed and we've walked into the classroom expecting to be at the same level when we walk in. So the idea of fairness pretty much needs to be thrown out. And if we could skip to just this this final slide and the idea of what we'll call J curve grading. Um, so we have four students in the classroom and, and Mitch walks in and he starts on grade level, pretty much finishes on grade level, which all things considered, which means he didn't grow, but he ends up at the spot. And we have Kristen that came in pretty much one grade level behind and she made nice steady progress and finished right on grade level. I've never met that kid, but if they do, they end up at the same spot. And then 
intentionally, I did it with a name, you know, Dave starts really far behind, but we have a really great teacher and he ends up in the same spot. Most of our kids are going to be like Phil, going to be up and down and up and down, and then eventually they're going to get it. Well, if we're making them pay for the sins of September and December, we really don't have an accurate representation of what they can do. And if we take Mitch in this example, it really isn't telling us that we've done anything. And there's a lot of kids in this example that are like Mitch. They come in, they learn how to play school, they don't really grow, they know just enough how to get where they need to be. And certainly their grade is probably accurate with academic standards. The problem is, is Phil ended up getting to the same place. And if we want to reward and talk about how important resiliency is, why would he get a different grade? And just as a kind of final footnote story, literally about a month ago, my five-year-old and my three-and-a-half-year-old figured out how to ride a bike without training wheels within 10 minutes of each other. My little three-year-old wasn't going to let his brother be the only one who did it. Now, what I'm not going to do is tell Zachary that he's got a lower grade on bike because it technically took him longer, although he thinks he did it first. He doesn't realize he's been on the planet for another two years. Somehow or another, it just clicked that day. And for Jacob, maybe seeing an example made it click for him. They can both ride their bike without training wheels now. They've acquired the skill, we're done. And that's how we almost do everything in life, except from the time pretty much when kids enter sort of middle grades until they end high school. So even most colleges now are getting a little bit smarter and focusing more on what they learn and not when they learn it. Won't go into that detail now, but at the end of the day, this is another way that if we focused on later evidence more and more students are at the end of the semester, what they've learned and how we've taught them, I think we could do a lot more for having grades have be more, have more meaning, have students really embrace the feedback and have a lot more accuracy. So there's one thing we take out of here today, the training assignments and all that stuff is, is good stuff, but eradicating the average is probably the biggest thing that will move the needle in terms of grades being accurate, honest, and students being represented with the, with the grade that tells them where they're at in the learning. Dave, I'll just say that I, I think we've had, uh, he gave some really interesting thoughts. Uh, a lot of them, uh, so some of them came uh, from John Hetty, and I, I think that Hetty's work is, is really interesting. And I know that Dave goes around the country talking to schools about how to more effectively grade. To me, that the idea that you don't have to grade in the beginning of the year as much or the beginning of a while, while students are learning and to more stack your um, stack your grades later on is is a fascinating idea I think uh, Dave is actually emailing me now so I think that that was a fascinating idea the idea that we should be grading less I thought was a was a great point um, that you should be grading on on competency um, I, I thought you know that was that's something that you can see is moving in education today and um, and I hope that you all got as much out of this as I did and let me just see if if Dave just came back in case I'll bring him quickly up to close uh, there he is Welcome to so Dave you cut off I I was trying to, uh, in my in my best fashion, I was trying to summarize for you, and I probably mangled it. So, uh, do you want to do you want to have a summary? Uh, sure. If you want to put that that final slide up with the contact info. Yeah, sure. Okay. In, in the meantime, I did have one question for you because you were bringing up that um, you know, not not grading as much, say, towards the beginning while students are learning, and and grading uh, more towards the end, and I, I just. What about the student who says, "Well, gee, if I'm not going to get graded till the end, I'll just, I'll just procrastinate." Is that is that an issue, or are there ways of handling that, or is it just not an issue at all? Sure. Well, certainly it's an issue, but I think that's also if they're not doing anything, they're not going to be able to arrive at the end where we want them to. And if they can't, I mean, let's just say they could could get away with doing that. But well, we've got an issue with placement. We've got an issue with curriculum, but. To say that we're not grading them doesn't mean we're not putting things in quote unquote a grade book and telling parents that they haven't handed anything in. Another way to maybe say it is we're grading in pencil. Mm -hmm. so we're reporting out where they are at today, but it's not permanent and we're not averaging it. So the idea that it would just be, well, I don't really have to do anything is is not the intent. Um, and certainly if we were to have a kid that was able to do nothing until the end and then show everything that he knew, well, he could have done it at the beginning. Tom Besky's got a pretty fascinating study of high school students that 
their grade at the start of the semester, like their first assignment grade, at a ninety two percent clip was the same grade at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. So Tom's question was, what were we doing during those eighteen weeks? Because pretty much where they started is where they ended. so Okay, so I'll bring myself down. I'll bring your slides up, and then maybe you can just um, you can summarize and tell me what slide to go to and summarize and end. Just the the very very last one. And again, I appreciate everybody taking the time on a Thursday afternoon. I don't know what the weather's like in other parts of the country, but it's certainly rainy as heck in Indianapolis. But maybe you're giving up a little bit of sunshine. Um, if you have thoughts, questions, anything at all on what we've talked about today, um, again, certainly I would encourage you, if, if there was anything that caught your interest and go into so much more detail, probably went deeper and longer with this book than I will ever do again, because I think it takes folks in a lot of different potential paths. Um, but again, I, I've geared it in a way, and I know, Julie, you mentioned sort of credit recovery. I have a whole section on, on what credit recovery and learning recovery really needs to look like. Um, and I think that's why it's so applicable even at the middle school, because it's not just getting the credit back. It's not just sitting there doing the seat time. Nothing against online learning. There's some phenomenal online learning platforms, but the only thing that drives online learning to be effective for student learning and achievement is consistent interaction by the teacher. No different than the classroom. So I, I kind of address credit recovery from a stance, whether you're doing online or traditional. But uh, again, I really appreciate everybody's time and an effort. If you have any thoughts or feedback, please shoot me an email, either at the Corwin address or certainly through the, the Twitter hash, hash tag in the uh, Twitter handle. So, Mitch, thanks for letting me uh, jump on again today. Yeah, Dave, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll um, we'll be posting the archive probably next week, and um, you know, have a great rest of the summer, and maybe we'll bring you back in the fall. Hope so.